Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Transforming Assessment webinar series. Uh, today, Danny Carroll from the University of New South Wales will be joining us, and he will be talking about meaningfully embedding program or degree learning goals into coursework. Um, and that's we'll be looking at the review tool that was uh, that is being used at the University of New South Wales Business School. So, Danny, would you like to begin, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And firstly, um, I'd like to just get people to indicate with a yes that they can hear me and that I'm coming very clearly. Can people give me a yes? Okay, great. I can see lots of numbers pouring in. So what I'd like to do very briefly is introduce myself and um, uh, discuss the shape of this talk. So I've been at the Business School at the University of New South Wales, which is a large research-intensive university uh, part of the sandstone G8 in the Australian system um, for about six years. And one of the uh, challenges and projects I was given early on in my time here was to come up with a way of tracking graduate attribute or program learning goal formation from students' assessment tasks. Um, and also, not just in an abstract sense, but in a way that would be useful for staff to uh, work with and meaningful for students. Um, so. We looked at a number of different software, and international and Australian, um, and in the end we decided to, uh, to embed trials in the review software because we felt it achieved many of the goals um, that we wanted to achieve, and not just ones purely around tracking data. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I've got sections, and I'm going to try and uh, uh, pause in uh, about two of them. Uh, I'm going to introduce what review is. Uh, I'm going to talk for a little while about assurance of learning and about the relations, a relation of assurance of learning to improving assessment, which I think is its, its, its most important goal. Then I want to talk in detail um, about our experiences using review and what, what I'd characterise this as a win-win-win experience because we've had quite good experiences with the outcomes we've had with staff, with students, and also with the ability to um, interrogate our learning. And uh, finally, we just have checking a, a you section. moving the slides forward there. Sorry, Matthew? I'm just checking that you want to move the slides forward. You need to press the button. Just want to make sure that you haven't got the um, yeah. game thing on. Okay. Oh, we're good. Thank you. Thanks for a reminder. Um, and finally, uh, a conclusion and discussion section. So if you do have questions, please uh, put them in the, uh, the, the text window. Uh, Matthew is my uh, shadow. This is a bit of a new technology and presentation format for me, so um, he uh, he might uh, he might uh, give me a bit of a nudge if he uh, sees them uh, piling up. So, firstly, very briefly, what is Review and why did we decide to use it? Well, Review is um, an online criteria-based uh, marking assessment system. It was developed at the University of Tech, uh, yes, University of Technology, Sydney, in about 2005 uh, by Daryl Thompson. So it was it was inherently designed by academics for academics, and it was designed to get academics to basically mark via criteria and to make clear to students and to staff markers what they valued, what they wanted to judge students against, what they wanted students to perform towards. So it's, a, it's an online criteria-based marking system, and it's, got, it's replete with uh, rubrics that uh, inform students about standards. Now, we identified that this was a really useful road to go down because, firstly, the use of criteria was very supportive of our university's um, policy and uh, insistence that academics uh, mark in ways that were consistent with standards-based assessment. So the policy around standards-based assessment. And the key things about standards-based assessment is some of them are that it, the assessments are explicitly explained to students. Students know what they're performing against. They get feedback against the criteria and standards they say that we're going to, to judge them on. And, um, and that feedback is, is fast and regular. So we felt that review and online criteria-based marking was a really, really good fit with standards-based assessment. Uh, the other things that we, we identified at an early point was that it was a, uh, it was a very, very clear and intuitive and fast uh, way to mark and give feedback to students. The absolutely essential thing, however, was review's ability to map assessment task data to 
um, program learning goals and program learning outcomes. So we needed a system that would not only track um, students' assessment achievement against program learning goals, uh, but also be able to report on those back to the faculty. Uh, but what we discovered fairly early on as well is that Review was a very inclusive software in that it also mirrored back students' assessment tasks and their criteria back to the program learning goals. If we just go on to the next slide. So I think I've mentioned quite a few of these things. So one thing uh, I think it's important to understand about review is it does allow for direct marking of student work, but it also allows for work to be conducted in other systems and marks to be imported. But again, it has an essential part of its DNA is that all of the assessment data that goes into review must be mapped against course uh, and program learning outcomes. And this is the, an essential step for reporting. Now, one point that I didn't make is another part of the review's DNA is that it, although it's optional, is it provides uh, students with the ability to do self-assessment. So when, uh, before a task is marked, a student has got the option, they can predict what they think they're going to get criteria by criteria. And using this frequently, I think, develops uh, their ability to self-judge themselves. So Susan Ellicott has asked about no more bell curve to meet. That's correct. Standards-based assessment, that's another key thing about standards-based assessment. Uh, the standards are explicit and there is uh, no requirement that a certain percentage of people are distinctions or high distinctions. So that's a really good point. We'll just go on. Now, when we, a little bit later on, I'm going to be giving, um, if I can master all the software, I'm going to be giving practical uh, demonstrations uh, of review. And what you'll see is that throughout the program, in the student screens, in the staff screens, and in the reporting screens, it's highly visual, but it's also very, very logical. Because throughout the, uh, throughout the program, students' achievements in tasks and against criteria is always mapped to the relationship of a criteria to a program learning outcome. So th this is probably a good time to talk about nomenclature, because all of the terms will drive people crazy. Uh, some people will tend to use terms like graduate attributes, Others will say program or degree learning goals. Some people will talk about the learning outcomes. And then when we get down to a particular you know, unit or a course or a subject, people will talk about the particular course learning outcomes or subject uh, unit learning outcomes or a subject. And this is further complicated by the landscape in Australia, where in some universities, uh, courses um, stand for, um, for, for programs or degrees and so on, so an added le level of complexity. But in our university, a program is a, is a degree goal. Uh, in the context of the business school, um, our pro program learning goals were uh, decided um, um, about 2009, 2010, been reviewed and revised every couple of years since. As part of our accreditation um, uh, push to gain Equus and AACSB accreditation. Uh, now, as many people will know, uh, accreditation both by Australian external bodies such as uh, TEXA and also by um, professional, uh, professional accreditation bodies is a really, really key um, outcome and preoccupation of uh, our faculties and, and the universities. And in fact, I think um, there is a, a, very, a very large, um, a very large being stick, uh, stick being waved by TEXA in relation to uh, 2017 requirements on all universities to quite explicitly demonstrate that they are able to map uh, students' long-term uh, assessment achievement uh, against the program learning outcomes that warrant that students are uh, uh, achieving um, what we, we say that we're, we're, going to, uh, we're, we're going to educate them on. And this is a real challenge for universities because to date our systems have been very, very disconnected and where a wealth of assessment data may exist in the hands of individual academics or 
in the, the vaults of particular schools and faculties, the central collection of data is usually done at a very, very simple level of just like a final grade, you know, 56 out of 100 or 76 out of 100 and a, and a, and a pass level. And certainly what we haven't done is to describe our assessment uh, to describe our assessment in a granular way that allows for the connection of lots and lots of assessment items to the formation of these degree goals. So in the business school, our degree goals are uh, reasonably generic, but uh, quite workable for us. So they run along the lines of written and oral communication, critical thinking, discipline knowledge, uh, teamwork, and ethical and social behaviours. And in 20 or 30% of our courses, at least, all of the ones that are using review in the business school, we have got very, very detailed and granular data about students' achievement in courses and over semesters and over years in the long-term fulfillment of that. And so we can, we can quite easily now produce these maps about student long-term learning. And I will demonstrate these to you uh, later, later in, the, um, in the talk. And Abby. I see you're saying self-assessment is the most powerful part of the software. Abby Cathcart from uh, QUT is a, is a long-term re review user. She's a bit of a review champion up there. Abby, good to see you online. And I completely agree. It's um, an area that I'm very interested in as well. If we just go on, this is a still from um, the current version of review. And it gives you a, a, a bit of an idea. Now, this is in the back end of the system. So towards the top, we have a program learning goal, and for the business school communication undergraduate, we can add description to it. Every program learning goal is associated with a color and a symbol. So the communication is a yellow pentagon. And the program learning goals might have children, which are their objectives, and oral and written communication. And these objectives themselves have got children, which are the criteria. When we do assurance in the business school, for the subjects that are chosen for assurance, we nominate that everybody must use a standard set of criteria. And they're on the right side of the screen. These standardized criteria live in a criteria vault that uh, I created in review several years back. This has been incredibly handy. Now, in our faculty, lots of courses that are not um, nominated to do assurance of learning for our accreditation needs also use review. So they use review because the Marking is uh, quick and easy, and it's, uh, it's quite suited to their particular assessments. In those courses, they are not required to use nominated criteria sets. But the people who are, they're used in lots and lots of courses. So this is all a back-end uh, part of the system. Once this has been created once, it can be used and reused in hundreds of courses over a number of years. Just trying to get the mouse to take me to the next slide. Sorry, a few mouse issues. Okay. So one of the one of the things that we did want to um, want to achieve with um, our assurance processes is that it would be meaningfully embedded in practice and have po powerful positive effects on practice of the staffs of the staff and the students. So it seems to me that a lot of time uh, the uh, processes of assurance are back-end processes and they have very, very little impact on either real-world teaching or student learning. Uh, and I think this is a tragedy. I think this is very, very, very sad. To me, the highest purpose of assurance of learning is to be an integral and integrated part of uh, a continuous improvement process. Um, this was the potential that we saw with review. We saw that it would um, make obvious to students that the task work was related to long-term formation of skills and attributes, and we saw that it would be potentially popular with staff because the marking interfaces were so intuitive and uh, so efficient. And that has generally been our experience, and, and that's some of the things that I'm going to uh, talk to in, in a few minutes. But this also, so I think I've covered a few of these points um, about what we are required to do, but also what we want to do. So in, in terms of the challenge for the business school, which is the same as the challenge for the University of New South Wales and many other institutions, is we have no choice um, about um, accreditation processes. We, we have to be able to produce um, reports 
that show that we are tracking and that we understand that we have self-knowledge and insight into our the progression of our students' development of uh, key skills and attributes in discipline areas. So this was not really a choice for the business school. And of course, it feeds into the idea of continuous improvement and course and program assurance. But where I'm going with this is all of these things should not be done with, um, you know, uh, with a, a, a tick box mentality. But I think really the best way to look at these things is a step on the road to holistic and future oriented assessment design and also holistic future oriented assessment system design. So our centralized university, our centralized university systems in the past have been characterized by maybe collecting, uh, not collecting a great deal of assessment data centrally, and also not being designed to collect assessment data that's got a really close connection to learning and learning outcomes and learning activity. So I think there has to be a stronger connection uh, between these things in the assessment systems of the future. And that's where I'm, I'm going next. I'll come back to that in a second. Just want to just look at the text chat for a sec and see if there's any questions. Is AOL CIRT on the previous slide? I, I know assurance of learning. I'm not sure about CIRT. Sorry, Barnard. Yeah, I'm not sure about CIRT, but it's, AOL is assurance of learning. Yeah, I'll, I'll press on. So I'll come, back to, I'll come back to the idea of future assessment in a few minutes. But in terms of the business schools road to program assurance, these dot points here were, were kind of paraphrased from the Assuring Learning website. So this is an Office of Learning and Teaching um, uh, project the last couple of years. Uh, it was chaired, or one of the prominent members was uh, Romy Thompson, formerly of UTS and, and UWS. And we did all of these steps, and then the, some of these steps took a, a couple of years of wrangling and many, many committees to work through. And so we did, we did do all these things. We established curriculum maps. We came up with a set of learning outcomes that we wanted to use um, uh, across the faculty um, and so on. And, and reviewers helped with the collecting data and reporting on students' performance and so on. But the one that I've highlighted in bold is this challenge of communicating program learning outcomes to students. And I think that's one that I haven't seen many examples of yet that have been done well en masse. Um, and, and I think that's something that re review does in a kind of embedded sort of way that you'll see when I demonstrate the product. So in general, in, especially in relation to assessment, students are often kind of left out of the picture. Assessment is an experience that's kind of done to students and one that they really don't really enough um, participate in. So the presence of self-assessment in review is one feature of the product that drives engagement with assessment activity. It tends to encourage students to, uh, to look at the criteria closely, to read the feedback more closely, and so on. And this is, this is again from the Assuring Learning website, and I thought this was worth putting up for a minute because I think the students are absolutely central to assessment processes, and we should, as assessment designers and as um, assessment system designers, or hopefully futurists, these are the sorts of things that we should be demanding, is that when we develop future assessment and future assessment systems, that the students are at the center of, uh, I guess, holistic stakeholders that we should share the assessment data with. Stephanie. Absolutely, agreeing, agreeing with Stephanie. We, we are very much in the business school trying to go down the road of integrating the progression uh, of, of courses into, uh, into a program view. And I think, I think um, in theory, everyone agrees with that process. I think it just takes time to keep embedding that in the culture. But yeah, I very much agree with you on that, Stephanie. So you can see from that slide, Students really, not only, not only should we be, be uh, providing clarity, control, and, and progression, but through our assessment systems, we should be 
visually presenting that back to students and giving students longitudinal access to their data so that they've, uh, they've got a, a long-term view rather than a very disconnected experience of assessment, which I, I suggest they have at the moment. So one of my big themes in my work is trying to improve assessment through systemization. So um, assessment is very disconnected. Uh, we, t we tend to uh, describe it very poorly. We certainly don't collect it with enough granularity. And then um, we don't really tie it, I, I think, enough assessment design to assessment for learning. And we certainly don't uh, track it or present it back to students as well as we could. So I think that they're the sort of things that we, we have to do better in the future. And so one of the things that I'm interested in, which I presented a paper on last year, um, is about what future assessment systems would look like. And some of the points I'd make very briefly here are, you know, is it is based around standards-based assessment, but all assessment relates back to standards-based assessment. And we have systems that can collect well-described um, uh, assessment data back to students for uh, program learning goals or degree goals or graduate attribute formation. So it would be the connection to learning. And then, of course, it's longitudinally accessible and visible to students, to staff, and to the institution. And because it's uh, available to students, therefore, it's personalized and more meaningful. And, and of course, it's all tied to and being supportive of learning. So students should be able to inter interact uh, with the assessment processes and really uh, through lots of ways like self-assessment, peer assessment, and even um, ongoing um, kind of e-journals, e e-portfolios that sit around assessment that they can access. So I think there's lots of work we can do to improve assessment in the near term uh, because I think we've got some good working models right now. And some of those you'll see today when I uh, when I demonstrate the review interfaces. Okay, I'm going to take a break for a minute. That's a lot to get through very quickly. Um, I'll just ask if anybody wants to put any questions into the text box. Matthew, thanks for putting up the Assuring Learning OLT site. I really found it quite useful when I was looking through that in preparation for this. Uh, folks, if you, while you're typing in, if you would like to actually ask a um, question via your microphone, you're welcome to do that too. You may stick up your hand using the virtual hand up symbol. Well, nothing coming in as yet. I'm quite curious about the weather in the UK and whether you're hear me, hearing me clearly there too. I'd love to know where the people in the UK are from as well, what you need. We're trying to see that come up. Okay. Now there's a question from Jackie. Uh, is there a capacity in review to set and encourage how students engage with their tasks? Well, the, the self-assessment aspect is optional, but certainly my research into self-assessment shows that when it's embedded uh, into task work meaningfully, it has a very, very big impact on students' engagement uh, with the task and the outcomes. Uh, apart from that, no, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that would um, unnecessarily encourage their uh, engagement, I think, apart from that. I would assume there's much to be done in the design of the overall assessment itself, because review is a tool to enable some interactivity to happen, yeah? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. It encourages interactivity on the assessment, but it, everything goes back to good assessment design. I mean, that's good task design. Uh, that's the, the start part. I mean, it's just software. Nothing's going to stop people putting in question one, question two, question three as criteria. Uh, yeah, into uh, Jeff. Absolutely. I mean, typically what we see is um, in the business school is the tutorial marking staff who only have to um, 
mark tasks that are already set up in review, receive no formal training. Uh, we just send them a how to mark document. Um, staff LICs who set up tasks, I'd say 30 to 50% of them also receive no training. They just figure it out for themselves. It's very intuitive software. And, and about half the staff would probably uh, sit down and train for about 30 minutes. So um, the, the, the barrier to entry or training is quite low. Uh, yeah, they come on board quite quickly. Okay. Well, I might, um, I'll answer another question if it pops up in the next sec, but otherwise I'll move on. And probably moving on to the most exciting part now because I'd like to do a bit of screen sharing. So I'm, I'm uh, crossing my fingers all goes well. And Matthew, you'll, um, you'll pop in and give me quick advice, I hope, if I look like I've stuffed up. Yep, if you remove the right button there, the little double, <laughs> double screen button will be right. Lovely. So now I'd like to, to talk about our experience using the software. And, and so basically I'd like to, um, to do some uh, say, uh, demonstrations from a, from a student point of view, uh, a staff point of view, and then from an institutional point of view um, about how review looks and works. Uh, and what I'd like to do from the student point of view is uh, just uh, point out how the interface relates particular criteria uh, back to program learning goals and objectives. So short-term to long-term learning, uh, plus the how the uh, student self-assessment uh, looks uh, to a student. Um, then in the staff marking, uh, I'm going to show you how the staff would see the student self-assessment and how they would mark, and also what, of course, uh, data is available to academics. And finally, the institutional reporting. Um, I'd like to show you what we get at, at, at that from a data point of view. So. If we just look at students, so the, the system is very visual. Um, the criteria feedback relates to from short to long term learning. Um, it connects criteria to program learning goals. It's personalized. The students can run their own reports and it involves self assessment. So, what I'm going to try and do, and hopefully I won't lose myself, is to, uh, to go into the student screen and um, share my screen with you and then come back. Super. Okay, great. So can everybody see a, a student screen for I'm a student? Uh, yes, I can see one. Excellent. So presumably everyone sees that too then. Super. Okay. Now, okay, I can see the one I want to go back button, I think. Good. So what I'd like to do is just to, to show you, this is the student's home screen. So if they've got tasks that uh, require self-assessment or they can look at the criteria, they go into this bit. If they want to look at published feedback from the past, they go to the bottom part of the screen. And you can see down here that this student has been in lots of courses in review and could look at lots of past data where they sometimes did self-assessment, sometimes didn't, but have been marked. And so they could go back to feedback from last year or the year before and so on. Now, the example I want to show you is in this particular task. So a very visual screen. Now this task this semester has got two criteria and they're both about knowledge. So this is an early semester task, task 1A, it builds on task 1. And they can see a map of this particular task and it's all about knowledge because every criteria relates back to knowledge. Now, if the student wants to do self-assessment, they basically make an estimate of what they think they will be marked for each criteria. So I think I was very good at identifying, but maybe not quite so good at applying. So I'm going to give myself a distinction there and a mid-credit there. That will give me an overall mark. And I think I did better on identify. I'll save that. Good. Now the student can come back and change this again. So we actually encourage students to, to do this uh, self-assessment step a couple of times before they submit to try and identify their weaknesses and so on. 
So what I'd like to do now is if I can get to my example course is to go to this course from the teacher view. So to do that, I'm just going to stop screen sharing that. And I'm going to have to um, screen share into another window. Just give me a sec. If I can find it. Sorry. I may have to screen share my whole desktop, I think, which might be a little bit messy. I'm nearly there. So now can you see my whole desktop? So Matthew, can you confirm you can see my whole desktop? Yep. So folks, if you're looking to the right hand side of his desktop, that's the screen of interest this time. That's correct. Thank you very much. So it's just going to take me a moment to bring up my sample course. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so now on the right hand side where I've got the cursor moving, um, we see the view of a course uh, course lecturer. And this has got all of the tab all of the tabs that show the workflow. They can see create tasks, they can create groups, they can mark the uh, mark the tasks, they can uh, check the data, and they can publish to students. And we're in task one A once again, and we can see student M has done self-assessment but has not been marked. So if I click on this button here, we'll see the marking interface. Now, you'll notice that I can't see the student self-assessment option because I don't see that until after I finish marking. But now I'm going to make a judgment on the students um, on this criteria, their ability to identify the relevant discipline knowledge. There are marks descriptors. You can add rubrics to these interfaces. So here you can say, you know, this is a very simple example. For this level, you've not been uh, not been good enough. But I'm going to give this student, they've done quite well on that, I'm going to give them a D, apply relevant disciplinary knowledge. The application has not been quite as strong, I'm going to give them a low credit there. So it's roughly about 68. And I'm going to give them some feedback here. Now you can see that the student has left a comment, so I might like to look at that. And they were right. Yes, that's right. Okay. So I might respond to that comment. And now I'm going to save. Now after the save action, we'll see that the student self-assessment estimate will come up. I'm just going to save that for a moment. Right. And the interesting thing here is after I've saved my judgment, the student self-assessment estimate, sorry, the student self-assessment estimate comes up, and in this case, the example student was very, very accurate. That's pretty unusual, um, but uh, maybe less unusual with the, with the very good students. Uh, but um, yeah, so we see the student self-assessment estimate and down the, on the black one, the staff mark. So once again, what we can see here is we've got a very fast and intuitive interface for marking. Uh, rubrics can be placed on all the grade items. All of the criteria relate up to higher level and longitudinal formation of graduate attributes or program learning goals. And we've got interesting options such as um, student self-assessment and uh, reflective text and um, the use of comment libraries, which of course these days is pretty ubiquitous. So for example, I've got the option to look at my own comments or comments from other markers or comments from the whole faculty. And when I suggest, when I choose faculty, this is actually truly faculty. This is every review, every comment that's been made in review in the business school in the last three years. And this is all searchable. 
So if I'm looking for things about application, I could find a previous comment I did about application and give that to the student. And so there's a lot of ability to recycle past work in review. So that's one of the nice supportive things that, uh, that we've developed to, uh, to help staff. You know, I think Abby Cathcart's doing a lot of the work answering questions for me. Thank you very much, Abby. I'll just pause for a minute and see what the conversation's about. Yeah, review does work well on mobile devices. It works really well on tablets. It works pretty well on phones. Yeah, Abby, I agree. That's a really interesting area to develop, longitudinal, because e-portfolios are often too disconnected from the world of assessment. And so to me, it would be a natural, a natural thing to develop review in that direction as well. Can this software talk to other systems, such as Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, and platforms? Yeah, absolutely it can. We haven't gone that step yet here, uh, but um, through LTI 1 and LTI 2, really I don't see any big difficulties with some low level and light integration of Mark's data transfer in both directions. It's all quite possible. And I know that uh, University of Southern Queensland has got a project team working on it with Moodle now. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, let me quickly fit in with your student. Yeah, so not not so integrated, uh, but really at the moment they're very very separate things. Review is a specialist software about uh, assessment, and you know Moodle and and Blackboard, while they're great products, try and do everything. But the assessment the assessment part in those platforms, you know, uh, uh, the quizzes are great, but the grade book. I don't think it's the gradebook is a great place to uh, base your future of assessment on. So that's a that's an answer to Carol in Bradford. Love to love to catch up with you when I'm there later this year, Carol. We we'll, we'll talk offline maybe. How much does the software cost? Um, we we pay about one dollar eighty per student license. Uh, use it for multiple choice exams. Doesn't it doesn't work so well for multiple choice exams? But review is a system that you can import data into. So you can run a multiple choice exam somewhere else and import it in so that you've got um, a longitudinal map of the fact that students uh, did something about concrete knowledge or operations um, so that they can reach that years later. Uh, peer review, Bhavani, really good question. Because it does self-assessment, I think it's only one step away from, uh, from being developed as a tool that supports peer assessment as well. I hope they do that. If I had the money, I would um, uh, I would um, get that built. Coming back down to the bottom. Yeah, one dollar one dollar eighty per student per year. The student can be in multiple courses. So the license cost is based on unique IDs, and the student can be in one course or ten courses in review. Yeah, and Abby's right as well. I mean, Turnitin is a great system for um, verifying that students have submitted work, and it's a great system for checking plagiarism, and it's an okay system for marking and giving feedback. But it's a particular type of feedback that um, that comes through Turnitin, and uh, my my view of it is it's a very very corrective mentality uh, in in uh, grade mark. Um, it tends to be very very bitty feedback. And I think there's a really interesting research question um, around whether short, concise uh, feedback in review is more actionable than lots and lots and lots of uh, bullet and balloon points in grade mark. I'd be very, very interested to, uh, to uh, work out how that could be approached as a research question. Okay, there may be another question that I might um, get on. So everybody, can I just get um, thumbs up? Everybody's seeing two two uh, two browsers in uh, in their screens. Yep, excellent. Good, good, good. So what what I'll do now is I'll just show you one or two more things on the markers screen. Um, so obviously you can put files to individual students. That's kind of nice. But when you're when you're finished marking. 
what people should do before they publish the feedback to students. Oh, I'll leave the page. Maybe I'll just save that before I go. Oh, no, I saved it. Okay, good. What people should do before they publish the um, marks and feedback to students is check the data. And on the, re on the reports screen, they get a visual indicator of the marks they've given, but they also get access to all of the numbers. And a little bit later, I'm going to run one or two of these. Sorry, I'm going to show you the output from one or two of these reports. The staff average report and the criteria marks report. Very interesting data. These ones over here are all about final marks that we use for individual assessment tasks or the finalization of the whole report, which is a university standard Eccles sheet. So let's assume that the marks are good. Now I'm going to go to this task and publish this student. So that student's now available on the internet. I could send them an email from review saying, please check your task 1A. Now going to the student view, if I hit F5, that, uh, that should refresh. Let me see. Yeah. So now in that task, which I've just published, the student who can also see the mark descriptors uh, can see that their self-assessment was pretty good. The black mark was what the marker gave them. We don't show them an actual number because we want them to concentrate on the level of quant quality of achievement. The grey one is the average mark of everybody who's been marked. In this case, only one student, so it's the same. But that lets them know if they're above or below average, criteria by criteria. And then they can see um, their comment and feedback from the teacher. And finally, we allow them to rate the staff feedback. And here, I'm going to, this student's going to give me three out of five. And uh, basically, that's that. So one more thing I'm going to show you before I move away from the student is the student has got the ability to look at years and years worth of data in review and to run reports on it. It's a pretty simple interface. It could use more work and development. But here we see that task 1A, which is published, had two criteria about knowledge. Task 1, which is published, has a similar task. And that was the first one. So 64, they got better at the second one, which was 1A. Task 2 has a number of criteria, communication and critical thinking. And task 3, which was maybe the exam, shows them doing really well in communication, really great in critical thinking, and pretty good in knowledge. And in this example, when I run all the tasks, the four tasks are brought together. And if the student compared what they were doing in task one, they would see that they've definitely developed their marks in the knowledge and the communication program learning goal areas. So this is, again, from the student point of view, and this is available in review right now. They've got the ability to run these reports in a course or courses in a semester and across years. In the commerce thing uh, here, they're in all tasks, they're a bit more even. Uh, if I go all courses for 2016 semester one, the results from those two courses are put together. So what we've got here is an example of personalized learning, democratizing student assessment data back to themselves in a, in a very usable interface. We haven't promoted this highly to our students, but a lot of students have informally come to us and said, I really like this. I can see uh, the progression of my data from a particular task across the course and across courses. So I don't know if anybody else has got a system like this working in their university, um, but we cracked it a couple of years ago in, in uh, cooperation with the, uh, the software maker Academ, who's licensed this from UTS. So I'd be really interested to hear uh, people's comments um, if anybody else is doing something similar. Uh, in, Ellen, in re reference to this, yeah, there's, they can print that from the screen as a PDF. And, and so we're going to definitely start encouraging that in the business school shortly so they know. But, uh, but um, yeah, it, it does get very interesting because all over the PDF, it's plastered all over it. This is not an official university transcript because only 20% of the courses in the business school are in review. Uh, but it's got the bones to be a, a more ubiquitous system.
Yep. Carol, I hear what you're talking about. I'll be in the UK actually in uh, July. I'm on I'm on leave, so we can talk about talk about um, having a Skype chat or coming up to Bradford if you want. Rachel F, I think it's a really good question. It goes to uh, staff professional development. Yep, Abby agree completely. Carol, I think there's there's some really good papers to be done on wasted effort in feedback. Um, you know, I think short, concise, actionable feedback that's focused on improvement is going to be, you know, is very very likely to be. There's lots of papers out there hinting at it, but I think there's ways we could study that for its effectiveness. <laughs> yes, I agree, Abby. Lots to research. Okay, I'm going back down to the bottom again now. All right. Absolutely, couldn't agree more, Jeff. Absolutely. So what I'd like to do now... Um, Vivani just asked a question. What, was, um, what format can the data be export for doing some analysis, i.e. closing the loop at the program level? Yep, why don't we go on to that now? That's great. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to, so I showed you before these course reports. So these are available to every lecturer in review and they all come out in CSV and XLS formats. What I'd like to do now is to show you the kind of faculty level of reports for these assurance of learning reports. And I'm quickly going to run one uh, while, we, while I talk and describe what they are. And basically, this is a, a, a query interface that I built in cooperation with the, with the maker. And it allows us to get to every bit of data in review, whether it's um, the results of one student or every student that's in the system. And the first thing I'm going to do is to choose five, uh, five or six assessment tasks in one particular course last semester. Let's make this a bit broader. And I'm going to run a program learning objective report. So written communication, oral communication, and so on. And I'm going to run it for every student that's in the course. OK, so the reports are usually pretty quick. So we'll just run that. And it'll generate data about the students' assessment achievements in five tasks, five or six tasks. There's about 200 to 220 students in, in uh, various tasks. Some of them dropped out. And it gives us their performance, fail, pass, credit, distinction, high distinction against the normal university grading uh, bands um, across those program learning goal areas. So here you can see 3% failed, and the, the academics will be quite happy with this. But in regards to granularity of the data, if we now look at this as a criteria report and rerun it, again, for all the students in 1401, we can see uh, criteria by criteria their performance at that level. So it's a little bit messy, but the, the first task has got five, four criteria, and that's how they performed. The second task has got four or five criteria. That's how the students performed. Uh, so I might just that's very, very useful information for the course academics. I'm just going to rerun that as an objective report because it's a little bit messy on the screen. So this. This is the kind of uh, output data that we need for program learning goals, and we can export that in an Excel format, or we can download that as PDFs. One of the things that we want to do in the near future is to liberate this data from the system and get it auto automated and basically sent out to our staff rather than us going to this reporting interface. Now, another requirement that we had as part of assurance of learning uh, was not that we just run course reports for every one of the 200 students in that course, 
but that we were able to identify the particular achievements of students who were just in economics or just in law or just in commerce. So these reports can be pointed at the students' enrolment in programs. So now we're going to run the report for only the students who are in the Bachelor of Economics. So this is the heart of assurance of learning with a program focus. And um, you can see that looks, number looks a bit funny, but that's what I would expect. There's about 80 students of those 200 uh, that are in uh, the Bachelor of Economics. And perhaps the last thing to demonstrate is, is it's worked quite well for multi-course reporting. So I could do multi-course and multi-semester reporting. I'll just do that now. So what I've done with this selection is I just selected four courses, and so that's all of the assessment data from many, many tasks in four courses mapped against the program learning goals, knowledge, critical thinking, communication, oral, teamwork, ethics and um, social and cultural implications in business. So what we've developed is a really vertically integrated assessment system that works nicely for students and does really good things with students, works great for academics because it speeds up marking and they have better assessment experiences. And they say, I enjoy my marking now more, which is just music to hear. And then on this side, the, the, the floor I'll basically finish the talk, um, is... Um, the ethics, ethics always needs work. It's new to us for assessment. Um, is basically we're getting fast and visual access to our data, and that's helping to you know meaningfully uh, meaningfully inform the the course and program assurance processes and course and program renewal. Um, in fact, uh, one of our one of our schools, one of our smaller schools, which it's a little bit easier for them, the School of Actuarial Studies, has mandated that review be either used for direct marking in every course or that assessments at least be described in review and that inf data, assessment data is imported into review so that the school can track the progress of the students right through from first year to fourth year and in postgraduate right through the course of their study. So that's a very, very interesting direction and, uh, and I think it's really a good test case to see review as uh, a centralised assessment system that other systems can import data into so that data can be mapped against um, long-term learning and assessment uh, results. Yep, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's not a, Jeff, I agree, it's not only the, the, the accurate mapping as well, it's, a, it's, it's an ethos of people uh, buying into the idea of describing the assessment describing their assessments in relation to meaningful learning terms, which are the longer term learning goals. Now, I think that's a good direction to go. Gavani. Yeah, that's a really good question, Gavani. This is all a weighted system. So before um, before I designed the before I wrote the design for this, we had many, many meetings um, about the right way, way to weight assessment tasks. So criteria are weighted as a percentage of a task. A task is weighted as a percentage of a course. Um, and therefore, when um, a, a, a program learning goal is assessed with a light weight in one course, review will calculate proportionally the assessment weight between the two courses. Um, so it's not just a did it here, did it there pass it's a weighting between courses as well. So that, you basically, it's been taken into account, your question. Sorry, Barnard, what, what is 2DP? Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, yep, absolutely. I'll go out of that. Super. Um, so that's um, so I think I've, I've made all those points about uh, student self-assessment and so on. And you've seen the uh, seen the re review screens. And basically, I can finish up on on these points. 
is uh, that it's been you know very very beneficial in terms of our access to our data, but also it's been well in well embedded in the people who uh, enjoy using review for assessment. Uh, it's been quite beneficial for our staff and students. Uh, there's a few references there on the on the final slide. Um, some papers and conference presentations I've given, uh, but also some uh, recent OLT uh, type references, and I believe that the, uh, the, the PowerPoint is shared with everybody afterwards. Uh, we're going to have a couple of maybe a couple of minutes to wrap up, um, so I hope this hasn't been too overwhelming a tour. Uh, but uh, I'm certainly happy to take. Um, Susan, um, no. So at the moment, we decided not to make the feedback loop and conversation endless. So the last point is where they can give feedback. We do collect that data, but then we'd have to infer why the students gave the rating they did. Um, by the way, folks, I'll stick up these as live links on the recording page on the Transforming Assessment website as well. OK, thanks for the thanks. Debbie. Barnett, I'm not so sure what your your question is. I expect your accuracy is less than figures quoted. I'm not sure of the context, but I'll be happy to uh, take that up with you at the end. I think he was referring to the fact that you've got two decimal places there and the system is probably not that accurate. Oh, he might be referring to the marking interfaces? Or... Ah, da, 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 da. Uh, oh, so so I see in the reports. No, no, all the testing we've ever done is has been perfectly accurate. Uh, but I'd have to take that on notice and check. Okay, folks. So I think what we'll do is we'll wrap it up here, given that it's a uh, five fifty-nine p.m. in uh, Melbourne. So. Thank you very much, folks, for joining, and um, please remember to fill our uh, feedback survey. There's a link in the text chat before you leave, um, but we'll be hanging around for a couple of minutes if you would like to continue asking questions. Yeah, I've, I'll just keep talking. Is that okay, Matthew? Yeah, no worries, no worries. Yep, yeah, um, so I'm just working down through the question list. So, uh, Rachel, Rachel James, Swansea, yeah, look, please, please stay in contact. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you later offline. Um, so that'd be great. And I'm gonna, as I said before, I'll be in the UK in um, July. So well, we can talk later. Um, Barnett, I worry perhaps foolishly about weighting of qualitative criteria to make up final marks. Well, no, I think this is, I think this is fair enough. I mean, all assessment decisions are to some extent fraught. Um, but I think we do have to make decisions. Um, in general, I would think that, you know, practicing academics I talk to say, often say things like these three criteria are more important than the other two, and I've, I've really got to weight them. But there's no necessity to weight criteria differentially. You can, you can set them all as being, uh, as being equal. Um, and, and I think also what you're alluding to as well is the, the problem of, the relationship between atomistic marking and holistic marking. And I agree with you completely. There is a real problem there. In the professional development that we do with our staff, we, we always tell them that their holistic judgment, their final judgment about what a student should get, should take primacy over um, atomistic or criteria level decisions because um, sometimes they can be quite misleading in overall judgment. So uh, I think that is a, a balance that has to be uh, realized in a, in a criteria based marking approach. So I, I agree with where you're coming from there, I think. Excellent. Uh, Abby, I'm glad you've reached the future. You're on the, the current version. Liz, thank you. Thanks all. Barnett, thank you. Pavani, excellent. We'll talk another time. Great. Shiona, excellent. Well, I'm just down the road. We should get together. Daryl Thompson is my mentor from there. So we should all get together and have a coffee. Have you ever talked to Daryl Thompson? Excellent fellow. Matthew, thanks for holding my hand through this. Uh, Jackie's just asked a question down the bottom. It says, is it worth doing a small-scale trial to begin with before doing it at a program degree level? So, sorry, say again, Matthew, breaking up. I'm um, sorry. That, um, so Jackie was asking, is it worth doing a small-scale trial 
to begin with, rather than at a program or degree level. I assume she means kind of at the unit course level. Yeah, oh, at, absolutely, absolutely. That's always wise. I mean, I wouldn't trust I wouldn't trust uh, some some uh, bloke you hear on a webinar. No, I absolutely think it's essential. We started with a trial in four courses, and now we're at 150 courses per semester. Um, you've absolutely, with new technology, you've absolutely got to suck it and see and see if it's a good fit with your uh, with your faculty team and with the things you want to achieve. So yeah, very. I'd very much encourage you to have a look at it. Um, it could work for you. It's, de it's definitely worked for us. Rachel, absolutely. We'll look forward to the email. And Carol from Bradford, excellent. Really, really great to have you online today. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, good to be reaching out to an international audience. It's been a big project. Yep, agree, Barnard. Rhonda, really glad it was good value for you. Thank you. So, see you, Abby. Talk soon. So, Matthew, okay. Um, yeah, I think we'll be wrap it up now. I'll stop the recording, but you're welcome to stick. You know, people are welcome to stick around and ask closing questions. But I just want to say thank you, Dane. It was a very interesting session. Excellent. Uh, and great value. Super. Can I, um, Matthew, can I ask, can you um, send me a, uh, a copy of the um, chat session so that I can... Oh, um, yes. It all it all ends up on our recording page. So the chat, the video, the slides, the, all the links, everything will be on there. So, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Good. I, I, look, it mostly went to plan. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, that was good. All right. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Bye. Okay. <laughs>